be seated. As we uh, go to the Lord in prayer, all authority and power has been given to him in heaven and in earth. Uh, That's who we go before. Let's pray. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we seek to be still before you today, and we pray that you would quiet our hearts and our minds with all of the things that are on our hearts and all the things that race and run through our minds and all the the cares uh, that perhaps we've brought into this place today, all the distractions. Uh, that would keep us from uh, being still before you, from hearing your voice, from being uh, touched by your heart. Uh, It's our prayer uh, that uh, we would find uh, the grace to be still before you this morning, uh, that we might find your joy, your peace, your strength, a renewed sense of hope, renewed sense of purpose. May we be touched by our brothers and sisters in Christ this morning, uh, that we would be renewed of mind, body, soul, and spirit. And as we meet you during this time, Lord, we pray that you would receive a blessing, that uh, you would receive our praise uh, from the depths of our heart, Uh, that we would bless your heart, uh, that we would know that we've been with you. So receive our our worship as feeble as it may be. And we pray that our time together would be a blessing to your heart. Uh, Thank you uh, for your presence. Lord, thank you for the reminder that you possess all power and authority. And uh, thank you, Lord, that there is nothing too hard for you to accomplish. And if we are in that state of mind where um, we don't believe that you're able to do, we pray that you would forgive us, and we pray that you would remove that spirit of unbelief uh, as we uh, fix our eyes on you, as we look to you. Uh, Father, I think of uh, the many in our congregation who are hurting. who physically struggle daily, um, may you in, in, in encourage their hearts, uh, comfort their hearts, uh, strengthen them in the inner person. Uh, may they uh, f- sense your presence, <clears throat> and may you uh, buoy up their spirit and uh, re- renew them uh, totally, uh, heart, mind, body and soul. Father, also, too, I think of our country. Uh, Lord, a very, very uh, needy country right now, and it's because we've uh, left you, we've kicked you out. Uh, We pray, Father, that you would forgive us for the sins of our country, and we ask and pray that you would move in a way throughout this uh, country, throughout our communities, Uh, throughout each state, that you would uh, allow your churches that preach the gospel to be uh, a catalyst for a spiritual revival and renewal. Uh, We pray that you would send your Holy Spirit, Lord, to sweep across this country and that we would return to you. Uh, We, again, Lord, know that nothing is impossible with God, and we ask and pray that you would be pleased to move in that way. Uh, We pray that a revival would uh, be rekindled in each heart here, in my heart, Lord, in each heart here, and in in your people uh, through uh, your churches and throughout this country. 
uh, that we might uh, be blessed to see you move in this way. Father, I want to lift up uh, Harold this morning. I want to lift up uh, Fred Legler, Sandy Sherman, uh, Edith Provetti, uh, Mike and Carol Shirtliff. Uh, bless their hearts and give them your peace that passes all understanding. Again, we thank you for this time. We want to give you the praise, the honor, and the glory, and we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Okay, we have our first reading of Scripture. Dave? This morning's first Scripture reading from the Old Testament. From the beginning, from the book of Genesis. From chapter 11, I'll read the first nine verses. And that can be found on page nine in the New Church Bible. Again, the 11th chapter of Genesis, the first nine verses. Now the whole earth used the same language and the same words. It came about as they journeyed east that they found a plain in the land of Shinar and settled there. They said to one another, come. Let us make bricks and burn them thoroughly. And they used bricks for stone, and they used tar for mortar. They said, come, let us build ourselves a city and a tower whose top will reach into the heaven and let us make for ourselves a name. Otherwise, we will be scattered abroad over the face of the whole earth. The Lord came down to see the city and the tower which the sons of men had built. The Lord said, Behold, they are one people, and they all have the same language. And this is what they began to do, and now nothing which they purpose to do will be impossible for them. Come, let us go down in there and confuse their language so that they will not understand one another's speech. So, the Lord scattered them abroad from there over the face of the whole earth, and they stopped building the city. Therefore, its name was called Babel, because there the Lord confused the language of the whole earth, and from there the Lord scattered them abroad over the face of the whole earth. May the Lord add his blessing to the reading of his word. Our second reading this morning is from the New Testament, the book of Acts, the second chapter, verses 1 through 13, and it's found on page 979 of the Bible. When the day of Pentecost had come, and they were all together in one place, and suddenly there came from heaven a noise like a violent rushing wind, and it filled the whole house where they were sitting. And there appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. <clears throat> now there were Jews living in Jerusalem, devout men from every nation under heaven. And when this sound occurred, the crowd came together and were bewildered because each one of them was hearing them speak in his own language. They were amazed and astonished, saying, why are, not all these who are speak why are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we, hear each we each hear them in our own language to which we were born, Parthians and Medes and Elamites and residents of Mesopotamia, Judea and Cappadocia, Pontus and Asia, Phrygia and Pamphylia, Egypt and the districts of Libya around Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabs, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And they all continued in amazement and great perplexity, saying to one another, what does this mean? 
But others were mocking and saying, they are full of sweet wine. This is the word of our Lord. Let's have a word of prayer. Our gracious Heavenly Father, uh, we pray that your Holy Spirit would be our teacher and our guide this morning. I pray, Heavenly Father, uh, that I would get out of the way and that your Spirit would be our teacher this morning. And it's in Jesus' name I pray. Amen. So, folks, uh, today is uh, Pentecost Sunday. Uh, we're not a liturgical church in that we follow a church calendar, but Pentecost Sunday is roughly like 49 days out from Easter Sunday. Uh, not exactly 50 days, but 49 days. And so today is Pentecost Sunday, and I want to talk to you this morning about the importance and the significance of the passage of Scripture in Luke chapter two, in, in Acts chapter two, that Bill had read this morning. Now take a look at uh, verse twelve, yeah, because all of what happened in the first half of Acts chapter two, the question is asked: What does this mean? In other words, how are we to explain what happened here? Now, this passage is about speaking the same language ultimately. It's about speak, in my opinion, it's about speaking the language of Jesus. And so that all believers might be empowered to be able to go and share what this means. Now, when you take a look here, there are many different languages that were spoken, uh, at least over 16, and I'll talk about that a little bit later. Many, many different voices. We don't know how many people gathered here. We do know that in Acts chapter 1, there were 120 who gathered in the upper room. And more than likely, that connection is carried over to chap Acts chapter 2. In other words, when the Spirit came, it wasn't only upon 12 disciples. It was probably more like 120 or more. And so, more than likely, women were in this gathering as well. Now, when, and, 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 I, and, I, and I think that what comes out of this text here is that even though they spoke many different languages, they all spoke about Jesus. They had the same language. And I think that that's very important for us to understand this morning. Now, when we come over to Pentecost, the spiritual parallel goes back to the Old Testament, as many of you may know. It was called the Feast of First Fruits, the Festival of Weeks, and it, that's because it was 50, Pentecost, 50 days out. So if, you, if you're a Messianic Jew, you're probably celeb you're, no, you're celebrating it exactly 50 days out, you see? If you're following the Old Testament, you're following it 50 days out from Passover. The Christian church, we designate the seventh Sunday from Easter uh, to celebrate Pentecost Sunday. Now, this is not, this is a, a spring harvest. This is not to be confused with the fall harvest, which is the Feast of Booths. And what's significant here is this. Passover, the uh, Pentecost, the, the festival of first fruits, and the Feast of Booths were three events that the males in all of Israel had to show up to the temple for. So this is a very hustling and, and, and bustling time. And what comes out of this here is this, is that when the gospel was preached, it was fruit bearing to God Almighty. When God poured out his spirit, it was fruit bearing unto him. Fruits. Now, how many of you have been to a festival or a fair? Most of us have been, right? Sometimes they run two or three days. This was, one, uh, this was a one-day feast. And, I, and after the, it kind of struck me here, but after the um, miraculous event, like the mighty rushing wind and the tongues of fire, and we'll talk about that in a little bit, notice that it came with a great accusation. Uh, in, 
in verse uh, 13, uh, it says, <laughs> they're full of sweet wine. That was the way some people would explain away the miraculous. Uh, if you go down to Acts chapter 2, verse 15, the scripture tells us it was the third hour. It was 9 a.m. in the morning. Now, I have to tell you, in my, in my B.C. years before Christ, I saw people drinking at 9 a.m. in the morning. Uh, hate to say it, I, at one time or maybe more, I was one of them. But this, this situation here, is, it's not late at night. It's at a festival, and that's what they conclude. Now, was there probably some wine a little bit later in the evening? Perhaps. But it's kind of a strange accusation and charge, because at least in my circles, and in your circles, and in most circles, we don't find people drinking at 9 a.m. in the morning. Thank God for that, right? And yet, it's not necessarily an unusual charge because people who have problems with drinking will drink 24-7. doesn't matter when they drink. It could be 9 a.m., 10 a.m., or 12 a.m. doesn't really matter. It's a feast. Now, what makes the charge, again, ironic is that we're just not talking about a group of guys hanging out and, you know, chugging. We're talking about a lot of people, at least 120. That's a lot of people. And so I guess their only explanation for what had happened was that people were slurring their words because they heard foreign speech. That's what they heard. They've heard a foreign language. And, and as I look at the text here, what this says to me is that there are always people who are going to be dismissive of the miraculous, of what the Spirit of God does. It's all throughout Scripture. You see it, you've seen it in your own life. Uh, I had a seminary professor. He spent 33 years in Argentina as a missionary. Do you know what he said? They came to pray over somebody, and they asked that somebody, uh, uh, they asked one person in their group as they were ready to pray over that somebody to leave because they had a spirit of unbelief. Now, I don't know if the person got healed, who they prayed over. But, you know, the spirit of unbelief, the being dismissive of God's ability to do, it's un unfortunately more common than we think. The, the other thing that I want to point out about this text here uh, is the topic of tongues. Now, this is not, if you read the text, the account is about a known foreign language. It's not about any ecstatic utterance or what some others would say are the tongues of angels. All right? Tongues were assigned to the unbelieving so that people would come to believe. And so when God pours out a spirit and they start speaking many, many different foreign languages, people are saying like, hey, these people, how do they know my language? They speak it perfectly. So th this, this is about foreign, a known foreign language, not an ecstatic utterance. And if you take a look at verse 7, it confirms this. The Galileans were not speaking like Galileans. They were speaking like the Parthians and uh, the Elamites uh, in, in later in verse uh, uh, the Medes, um, residents from Mesopotamia, etc., etc. That's what was happening. And if you go down to verse 11 in the text as well, uh, they say, we hear them in our tongues or our own tongues. So it was a known foreign language. I'm not going to get into the, the, the other part of the ecstatic because... You know, very controversial. Let me just say this. I believe that God, uh, the gift of tongues is still operational today. I haven't experienced it. I don't have it. But I don't be dismissive of it because I've known many believers who have that gift. That being said, the passage is not about tongues so much as it is about the outpouring of God's spirit. He uses tongues. <clears throat> 
And these tongues were to speak volumes to an unbelieving crowd. If you, the other thing I want to talk about, too, is if you notice in the bulletin, I had Dave read Genesis 11 and Bill read Acts chapter 2. And I want to talk about those two because those chapters are kind of like spiritual opposites, but I think it brings great revelation and light to the, to the scripture here. When you read Genesis 11, it's a chapter of chaos and division and confusion and rebellion. God told the, the, the people on the earth at the time, be fruitful, multiply. But they decide to be rebellious and not do that, and then they decide to build a tower to Babel. Not so much a tower, but a, a place of false worship associated with Nimrod. The, the antithesis of Genesis 11 is often seen as Acts chapter 2, where God pours out a spirit, not because of, we have in Genesis 11 rebellion, but in Acts 2, because of the obedience of one man, Jesus Christ, God pours out a spirit. And God is showing us now that Jesus is the great unifier between God and man. He's bringing it all back together. Uh, Romans 1, 3, concerning his son, who was born a descendant of David according to the flesh, who was declared the Son of God with power by the resurrection from the dead, according to the spirit of holiness, Jesus Christ our Lord. So the spirit is being poured out to affirm the resurrection of Christ and the promised spirit for the age to come. And so it is the spirit of Christ, the spirit of holiness, who was poured out at Pentecost. Now, if you, if you take a look at Acts 2, you don't see a reference to Genesis 11, but the parallels are really, really striking. And if you take a look at the Bible as a movement of the whole here, right? In Genesis 11, what we have is God scattering the nations because they reject his word. And then when you come over to Acts chapter 2, you have God gathering the nations, so to speak, to receive his word. And, and those are huge contrasts. Huge, huge contrasts. And as you go through Acts 2, and we won't be able to do this today. I don't know if we'll, I'll be led to do it next week. But if you go through Acts chapter 2 and the rest of the book, the history of the church, uh, and it's been pointed out that the book of Acts really has never ended, Redemption is always through one man, the Lord Jesus Christ. And in Acts 4, we're told that there is no other name under heaven and that there is salvation in no one else. And that's the great unifying message of the church. And, and, and what I want you to see here is this, is that the message is to reach across the great divide of, of human barriers, of language, of communication. You know, you get, you, you, today, you get nations and diplomats and they come together and they try to speak and it usually leads to more war. But yet God has this great unifying message of peace with God through Jesus Christ. And it's, to, and it's intended to reach many tribes and many people groups. And, and the other thing that I see here is this. It's, it's a message of clarity. There's a spiritual oneness that comes through the unity of the Spirit. They're, they're, they're of one mind. We le read later in the book of Acts, they're of one mind, of one accord, and they, even though they speak different languages, they have the same message. I have a friend who, um, back in 2018, out of nowhere, a pastor from France contacts this guy. And it says, would you come over and share the gospel with us? Now, this, my friend is, did not know this French pastor from Adam. Never heard of him before. But somehow they got tapes and they interpreted those tapes. And so they reached out to Ed and they said, come on over to France. <laughs> and, and he was advised not to go because of health concerns. He was going by himself. And he says he gets off the airplane in Paris. He doesn't speak any French. 
He doesn't know where he's at. He doesn't know where he is. And he's waiting for somebody to come up and say to him, Hi, I'm so-and-so. I'm your interpreter. I'm going to take you where to go. And so the long and short of it is, he goes to this place. He stays with people he never, ever, ever met before. They, they, they just open their home like as if he was one of their own. And he shares the gospel through an interpreter. <laughs> and he flies to Paris to do this with 10 people. All expenses paid by him, not the group. And at the end of eight days, do you know that the Holy Spirit came upon family members, not the 10 who gathered, but the Holy Spirit came upon, upon family members who were prayed for and prayed over, and it was just, he said it was absolutely unbelievable. And yet he was told not to go to France because of health concerns. And, and what kind of struck me here is this. He didn't speak a word of French, but what he spoke, interpreted, they understood. They understood the message because it was about Jesus. Have you ever gone to a foreign country and, and you know, you don't speak the language? That, that's pretty intimidating, isn't it? I, I went to Germany, in, I went to Europe in 1985. I went to Germany in 1986. I'm, I'm fluent in German. Did you know that? Yeah. That's all I say is yeah. <laughs> I sit there and, and it's like yeah, 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 bitte, danke, bitte, yeah. That's all it is. <laughs> My point is this. You and I could go to Europe be with other brothers and sisters in Christ. And even though we don't speak the same language we do, because we're of one accord, that's what comes out of the book of Acts. And it's a beautiful, beautiful message. You know, the other thing here is there's kind of a theological way to look at this, and I want to kind of touch on it because it's theological. But again, this is the fulfillment of, of, uh, of the promise of Christ to send the Holy Spirit. If you go back into Luke chapter 3, John says, I baptize, John the Baptist says, I baptize with water, but the one who comes after me will baptize with the Holy Spirit in fire. And that is the fulfillment of Acts 2 here. Uh, Jesus confirmed also in Mark 16, verse 17, that when that would happen, new tongues or other tongues would be spoken. All right? Uh, new tongues in Mark 16... Other tongues, Acts 2, verse 4, same thing. The point is, is that tongues would happen. Now, the other thing is, too, is, as you probably know, if you've been in a Bible study before, oftentimes people will say, well, this is the birthday of the church, the outpouring of the Spirit of God. What is the church? It's important to understand, ask this question. The church is, according to Ephesians 2, the Apostle Paul, the church is Jew and Gentile under one roof. So in the Old Testament, you have the nation Israel. In the New Testament, you have the church, Jew and Gentile under one roof. And it's a, it's, it's, this is, was a, a time that was ordained by God at some point to happen. You don't find the church in the Old Testament. You don't find an outpouring and an indwelling of the Holy Spirit uh, like in the Old Testament like we do in Acts 2. And we're going to talk about this because... It actually comes upon all of the disciples. If you go back into the Old Testament, the Holy Spirit came upon the kings, the prophets, various people to carry out various tasks. But the difference here is the Holy Spirit came upon all the people. Now, the, the, the reason why I bring up the, 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 the theological aspect is, is because I want you to understand this. What happened here in Acts 2 is an end time event. Uh, I've said this before, but a lot of times, you know, people will come up and they'll say to you, are we living in the end times? You've, you've had the question, right? Are we living in the end times? The way you want to understand that what happened in Acts 2 is this was an end time event. When Peter gives his message in the second half of Acts 2, 
He quotes from the book of Joel about God pouring out his spirit in the last days. And so the way we understand this, and this is important, the cross, the resurrection, and the outpouring of God's spirit are all end time events that happened 2,000 years ago. So if somebody says to you, are we living in the last days? Yeah, we are. Maybe the last, last days, based on the craziness that we see? God only knows. But, but I point that out because there, there's a huge, huge nugget of truth that comes out of this that I think we readily miss. Where were the disciples when this happened? They were in an upper room. Now, we don't know where the room was, but this is the picture. There was a spiritual state of readiness with all of the disciples. That's the picture here. They were in the upper room. They were in one place. If you will, they had oil in their lamps burning. They were waiting for God to come. Now, you tell me how many believers have that state of readiness upon their heart and their soul today. One accord, one place, oil in their lamps, and they were waiting. And that's a huge, huge takeaway here. And oftentimes when we get into Acts 2 and we talk about the theological end of it, we don't really touch on that, do we? But this was a spiritual state of readiness. They were told in Acts 1 to go and to wait. And they were all in one place, every single 12, one of the 12, because Acts 1, they had filled Judas's position, vacant position, and they were waiting. The, the other thing here that I, that I think is really, really important is when we talk about the church, we want to understand that we have a unifying message and a unifying spirit of redemption. What should totally come off the pages of, 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 of this passage of Scripture is the unifying message that we have in Jesus Christ. I alluded to this a little bit earlier. Redemption is found in none other. And if you were to read Peter's sermon, that's the essence of his sermon. Repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the forgiveness of sins. So the way we want to look at this passage here is this. When you become a believer, the Holy Spirit comes upon your heart. You're empowered and filled with the Spirit. Take a look at verse 4. They were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance. So when you become a believer in Jesus Christ, and I'm not talking about an extra filling or extra baptism in the Spirit. I'm talking about that when you accept Christ as your Savior, in the deepest recesses and bottom of your heart, the Spirit of God comes in and He lives within you. He indwells for the very purpose to communicate the gospel of Christ and to assist us and to be witnesses and to help us live the Christian life. And so we carry the message of Jesus. That's what we do. Now, the other thing here I want to highlight uh, about this text, and I don't want to get into, you know, um, being strangled or entangled with, with the miraculous event here. I want to kind of talk principles. Um, but if you notice uh, with the passage... Uh, there wasn't a mighty rushing wind. You know, we always talk about, you know, the mighty rushing wind. Uh, Luke says it, the, the sound was like a mighty rushing wind, but it doesn't say that there was a rushing wind. And that sound filled the whole house. So it would almost be like, I don't know, maybe you have the sound of a hurricane without the wind, but it was the sound like a mighty rushing wind. But it doesn't say that, it was a rushing wind. And, and then the other thing we have here is we have tongues as of fire. It doesn't say that they were tongues of fire, but tongues as of fire. And so what Luke is trying to communicate here is the miraculous from a human perspective. Now, 
if you and I were there, if you and I were there, the visible would probably float our boat, just like the visible floated the people's boat back then. Got their attention. But is that really the point of the passage? I, I don't think so. The, the point of the passage is that God has sent help. He has sent somebody to live within and to be by our side and to never leave nor forsake. You know, and I, and I say that if you go back to the Great Commission and, and what Christ talked about is that he would send another helper to live and dwell within and to teach and to never leave nor forsake. And that's huge here, folks. That is totally huge. I'll tell you what. If God came and went, I would be a worse Christian than what I was, than what I am. If God just came and left and came and left, what kind of... What kind of life is that? He never promised that kind of life. Uh, Lo, I am with you always to the end of the age. So it's about God giving himself to assist us in getting the message out. And you and I are able to do that based on our faith and belief in Jesus Christ because we've received his spirit. Let me ask you, where, where would you and I be this morning if we did not have the ministry of the Spirit of God in the church, in our hearts, in this place? Tell me, where would we be? Where would we be if we didn't have his indwelling and his teaching? Uh, we, we'd have more heresy than you could shake a stick at. So, as I look at the text here, what I think is at the heart of the visible sign of tongues and fire is this. It's, it's a sign of unity. The, the, the picture here is that when, when God came down and poured his spirit out, that there was this huge flame and, and, and pieces just broke off and came upon everyone. That's the sense of, uh, that's the picture here. And, and, and the picture is God's presence, God's purity, and that always goes with the message of the church. Take a look at verse 3. The scripture says, There appeared to them tongues as of fire, distributing themselves, and they rested on each one of them. And, and this, is, this is the effect. Many different people, one message. Many different abilities, one message, but each has been given the ability to speak on behalf of Jesus Christ. You know, in, in our day and age, you know what we do? We, we oftentimes limit everything to the pastor, don't we? That's what we do. If you take a look at verse 3, each, each was given the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit rested upon each. All received them. If you go over to 1 Corinthians 12, and, and you know this, most of you know the scriptures, right? We're as members, we're of one body, we have unity. Uh, this, is, this is simply a, 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 a tremendous message of unity and oneness in the body. I, I love what a theologian wrote, a Lutheran theologian. He said, quote, The Spirit fills every single believer in the church, uses everyone in his mighty and blessed work. Pentecost raises all to the same level. And that's so true. Uh, I'm not any better than you, and you're not any better than anyone else. As members of the body, we have a function. We're gifted. We're all on the same level. What, what does Paul say? Galatians 3.28, we're all one in Christ. That's what comes out of Pentecost in the work of Jesus Christ. No spiritual caste system. You know, you go, you go to the Far Eastern religions, you know, you go to the religions of India and they have a caste system. You go to other religions, you know, other perhaps denominations, you have a caste system. You know, clergy over laity. That's not what the scripture teaches. And, and as I look at this text here, we all speak the same language. We're all one in Christ. Same spirit, same message. Uh, someone wrote, and, and this is so, so true, 
When the heart is filled with God, the mouth utters, the tongue confesses, prayers go up, one testifies and speaks of the glories of Christ. Is that, is that your personal experience? It's mine. It should be yours. Let me say, when the heart is filled with God, the mouth utters, the tongue confesses, prayers go up, one testifies and speaks of the glories of Christ. And I, and I think that that's exactly what happened here. You know, when I was preparing the message, I felt like the Holy Spirit took, let me, I'm going to read a text for you. Revelation chapter 7, verse 9 and 10. Because uh, when the heart is filled, what happened in Acts 2 also happens in Revelation 7, uh, verses 9 and 10. John writes, After these things I looked, and behold, a great multitude which no one could count, from every nation and all the tribes of the peoples and tongues, standing before the throne and before the Lamb, clothed in white robes and palm branches were in their hands. Listen. And they cried out with one voice, <laughs> one voice, saying, Salvation to our God who sits on the throne and to the Lamb. And I don't care if you're, if you're in heaven or you're on earth. It's one voice, isn't it? That's what it is. Uh, this, this chapter here has been called the Resurrection of Unity chapter and the, the Symphony of Confession chapter. Why is that? Because the Holy Spirit is central to the Christian church and the message of the Lordship of Christ. If you don't have that, if you, if, if, if you have a group that gathers and does not promote the Lordship of Christ, you do not have a Christian church because they don't have the same spirit. And, and, and if you come to Acts chapter 2, this is, this is a witness-bearing event. And if you skip down to verse 11, I want you to notice that the unbeliever said, we hear them in our own tongues speaking of the mighty deeds of God. And it's none other than the mighty deeds of God in the person of Jesus Christ. Now, I mention all that, and this is, and got it kind of into the theological. This is very, very important because we're living in a day and age where many people call themselves Christian. But listen, they're not necessarily followers of Christ. That's huge. They call themselves Christians, but they're not followers of Christ. Now, I say that because I'm not sitting in judgment. I sit in judgment of no person. God knows my heart. God knows your heart. God knows the hearts of everyone. I don't sit in judgment of people. But what the scripture does say is this. Romans 8, 9, but if anyone does not have the spirit of Christ, he does not belong to him. That's huge. So people can call themselves Christians, but they may not be followers of Christ. So what is, the, what is the simple litmus test? I once knew a minister who raised the question, do they speak like a Galilean? That's a great question. Do they speak like a Galilean? Take a look at verse 6. Because these devout Jews, were, they were of the diaspora. They were scattered. But what they did was, scattered in all different lands, but these were the people that came back and retired in the city of Jerusalem. That's where they retired. And they spoke foreign languages because they lived in foreign lands for years. But this is what they recognized, and this is so, so important. They recognized that the Galileans were not speaking and acting like Galileans, right? Now, they were pointing to a simple truth. Galileans spoke like Galileans. They looked like Galileans. Remember when Peter was around the campfire when Jesus was being scourged? And 
He's around the campfire, he's warming himself, and you know, various may, uh, servants, girls came up and said, you're one of them. You're... No, he's, no, no, no. Well, anyway, some of the bystanders turned around. This is what they said. Matthew 26, verse 73 says, and a little later, the bystanders came up and said to Peter, surely you two are one of them for the way in which you talk <laughs> gives you away. Now, do you speak like a Galilean? Do you speak like Jesus Christ? The people that you listen to on the news or politicians or leaders, pastors, teachers, do they speak like Jesus Christ? Do they speak like a Galilean? And now obviously I'm spiritualizing the text here, but the principle is this. When you spoke like a Galilean, if people spoke like a Galilean, it was recognized. And if you speak like a Christian, it should be recognized. Literally, the scripture says, it makes you evident. If you have the spirit of Christ in your life and in your heart, you have the ability, you should be speaking like Jesus, like a Galilean. Now, the Galileans spoke a foreign language, and obviously I'm, but I'm using this as a spiritual principle. They spoke like a Galilean. They spoke the language of Jesus. Peter was accused. He was guilty of it. Amen. I'm guilty of it. I hope you're guilty of speaking like Jesus. And I think that one of the great truths that comes out of this passage is this. Does one speak in the power of Christ, of the Spirit? Does one speak the language of God in Christ? Is one speaking the language of, does one speak of the glories of Christ? That's a central truth, folks, that, that comes out of this text here. Verse 4. As the Spirit was giving them utterance and they spoke about Christ. Uh, they, they were filled to speak truth. Uh, the psalmist writes in Psalm 87, verse 3, glorious things of thee are spoken. It's not so much about Zion, the city, as it is about God who inhabits the city. And Peter goes on in this chapter later to speak about the glories of Christ in his gospel. And you and I have been commissioned to speak of that. I mean, that's one of the main reasons why we've been saved. I've said this before, and I'll say it again. Listen to what people are saying today. You hear many voices today, a lot of different languages being spoken, but is it, is it with the voice of Christ? Great discernment, folks, needs to be to be brought together here today uh, to filter the noise. There's a lot of noise. Who's speaking what? Parse their words. Listen to their speech. Listen carefully to what they say. Reflect on what I say. Do they teach and preach as if they have the Spirit of God? Is it from God? Uh, you can dial up just, just about any Christian station, anything on the web. You can get, you could get ministers 24. What are what they saying? Is it from the Spirit of God? And then let's, let's not even go there with the politicians. Oh, my goodness. Oh, my goodness. Don't get me started. You know, I, I was thinking, we have a, we have a world where English is the dominant language, right? And yet, how many people are speaking with the tongues of men devoid of the Spirit of God? And how many are speaking with the tongues of angels but demonic ones? I mean, there's, 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 there's no shortage of the demonic today, is there? None whatsoever. So I would say to you, listen carefully to the message to discern to discern what, it, what is coming from a person's mouth. Is it from the Spirit of God and the throne of grace? Because as, uh, as, as it comes off the pages of Acts 2 here, God's church, God's people, God's ministers 
have a unifying message of the gospel of Jesus Christ and his lordship. Anything else short of that? It's, it, as I, my Spanish, no bueno, not good. This is the meaning of Pentecost. You and I are empowered to speak truth to our neighbor. We're not to shy away from it, but we're to boldly trust that the Holy Spirit will give us the proper words to speak and to say. You know, I understand about wanting to shy away and not say certain things today in a politically correct and charged environment especially when you have a physical pulpit. I'm not going to do it. I'm not going to pay, play the PC game. Amen? Speak truth. Very quickly here, I'm almost done. If you go down to verse 11 or 10, uh, you know, actually verses 9 and 10 and 11, I counted 16 groups in all. Uh, of the various groups that are mentioned. And it was pointed out that Luke is basically taking all the groups that were there kind of like in a east to west, at northwest and circular south. So he kind of like he starts at the east and kind of goes north and west and to the south and kind of the, the known world, so to speak. A little bit of hyperbole, but the point is he's br bringing in a lot of people groups. And I, and I, and, I, and to the point where none were left out, so to speak. Because each group says, we, we each heard in our own language. And I think that that is a beautiful picture of how God and the church is to take the message to all the nations. And we're, and we're told, are we not, that the gospel will be, will be preached in every nation and then the end will come. Even, it will even be preached in Sri Lanka. Like right now, 99% Muslim, you can't even get in there. But it will be preached there. One final thought. Uh, some were blessed to hear the message that day. and Others mocked. And, and this, is, this is the contrast in the reality. When you get somebody, when you share the gospel of Christ with somebody and they mock you. Know this, they don't understand the language. They don't speak the language. As the scripture says in 1 Corinthians 2, verse 14, a natural man does not accept the things of the Spirit of God, for they are foolishness to him, and he cannot understand them because they are spiritually appraised. And so, what Luke is pointing out here, or what I want to point out through the text here that Luke writes, they have a different spirit, they have a different tongue, a different language, and a different character. And when the gospel goes forth, expect this kind of reaction. The reality is, it's a sad reality, you're going to encounter people that are just going to be totally dismissive of what you have to say and what God has done in your life, in your heart. But that's okay. Because it, it's God who gives ears to hear. Uh, we just obey the message and we go, right? That's what we do. So in, in, in summing this up, the church has one unified message, one spirit, one Lord, one Savior. We speak the same message. That's so, so precious. And, um, and, I, and I hope and pray that... Um, that you can take this in a way and work it where you understand that, that God has graced you and gifted you and empowered you to send you to go. And you don't have to go to a foreign country like my friend in 2018. Just, just go to your neighbor. Go to your relatives. Go to your work, the people you work with. Uh, but, but God has empowered the church to do that. And I... And I, and I think that oftentimes we, um, we, feel, we feel weak and incapable of doing that. And when we do, that's a good thing. Because then God will rise up. He'll take care of it. He always does. I wasn't even sure what I was going to say here this morning. But he takes care of it. 
Let's pray. Gracious Heavenly Father, uh, thank you for the passage of Scripture uh, that we've just looked at. Uh, thank you for the outpouring of your Spirit. Thank you that uh, he indwells to assist us to live the Christian life, to speak truth to our neighbor, and uh, to be empowered to share the gospel. Uh, may we be ever mindful of these truths as your Spirit urges us and um, prods us to uh, speak truth, and, and may, may we recognize those moments and those times where it's, uh, where it's Holy Spirit-led and um, we, we don't force it in the flesh. Uh, so we thank you for the opportunity to, to gather today uh, to speak the same language, to look at your scriptures. Uh, may you empower us to go, and it's in Jesus' name we pray. Amen.